A few weeks ago, we talked about my first real machining project on the new metal lathe. In that video, I built an ultrasonic homogenizer, which is essentially a small spike that vibrates very fast and is used to break open cells and make emulsions. Since then, we actually got a chance to try it out in the lab and used it to extract some fluorescent proteins from E. coli. Today, I want to take you through my latest machining project, and honestly, I'm really proud of this one. Over the last few days, I made this, which is a rotary vacuum coupling. Why did I make a rotary vacuum coupling, you ask? Well, it's one of the main components of a device called a rotovap. A rotovap is essentially just a really fancy distillation system, but unlike a normal distillation where you need to heat your substance to boiling to move the solvent, a rotovap uses gentle heat, rotation, and vacuum pressure to move the solvent from things that are either too delicate and or too stubborn to be distilled or dried normally. We actually got a chance to use one in a really old video I made a few years ago. In that video, we were chemically modifying fluorescein, the fluorescent yellow-green dye used in everything from highlighters to hematology. The last step of the process after the modification was done was to dry the modified fluorescein back down to a powder. But fluorescein is notoriously difficult to dry, but also too delicate to heat up very much. So we used a rotovap to remove the solvent. These days, I want one for similar reasons. I don't plan on using it that often, but I thought it'd be a fun machining project and useful to have. I'm starting to work on more biomaterial stuff, like dissolving silk proteins and making chitosan solutions, and in both cases, the only way to make a really concentrated solution of each is to make a dilute solution first and then remove some solvent. But both are heat sensitive, so a rotovap is the ideal tool to do that. Today we won't be building the whole rotovap, as I still need to finish installing the vacuum system into the lab and get my cooling pump set up. And instead, we'll just focus on making this coupling. It's the hardest part of the system by far, and the rest is mostly just off-the-shelf parts that fit together. When we get to the biomaterial videos, I'll set up the whole system and put it to good use. Anyway, let's jump right in. The main design challenge is to build a coupling where the top won't rotate so that it can connect to the main distillation apparatus, while the bottom can move freely so the flask that's attached can be rotated slowly in a water bath, all while maintaining the internal system under vacuum. The way I solved this was to make two pieces of Teflon that lock together using an O-ring. Thanks to a groove that I've cut in both halves, an o-ring can fit in between which makes an airtight seal, but since it's in contact with Teflon, it can rotate smoothly. The ends of the coupling each have the proper shape to match the 2440 ground glass joints that fit in and on here. To build this, I started with a piece of Teflon that's longer than I needed since I suspected I would probably make a mistake when it came to cut the conical ends. I'm starting with the lower half of the coupling here, and after loading the Teflon into the lathe and taking a facing cut, I drilled a hole through the stock. I chose to work on the cone end first as I figured that was the bit I was most likely to screw up. I'd taken some measurements off of my glassware and figured out that I needed an angle of 2.8 degrees, but since it's not easy to set this on the lathe, I just eyeballed 2.5 degrees when I set the compound angle, and it seemed to work fine. It's hard to convey in this video how snug of a fit these parts turned out to be in the end, so precision here really isn't super crucial. Of course, I ended up overshooting a bit while I was cutting the taper, so I had to fix that by trimming things a bit. This was a recurring problem where the rim of the glassware was bumping into something preventing the cones from coming into good contact with each other. So by removing the blocked area, the cones could come into contact and seal properly. Once that was fixed, I turned everything around and could trim the part to length. Now all that's left is to work on the actual rotary joint. This half will be the outside of the coupling, so I drilled out a 1 inch long cavity with the largest drill bit I had, and then widened it to final dimension using a boring bar. To tidy things up, I used a little bit of tailstock support to let me take a skim cut on the outside surface to get rid of any of the blue marking dye and any scrapes and scratches. Next, onto the other half. Same basic idea, but this time I started with the rotary end. I marked out one inch and then reduced the diameter until it fit snugly but could still rotate in the other half I'd just made. After choosing a spot for the o-ring, I used my parting off tool to cut a groove to fit it. The depth of this groove was gradually increased until the two halves could fit together with a bit of effort. Once that was done, the end was drilled out and tidied up before the part was turned around. To make the cone required that I first drill out the center to make room for the boring bar, and then resetting the compound to be tipped 2.5 degrees in the other direction. But after that, cutting this was really easy. Once I knew the fit was good, I could take a couple of cleanup cuts and this part was complete. To finish the coupling, I now need to go back to the first half and make the other half of the o-ring groove. This ended up requiring that I whip up a quick tool for the job, which I just made out of some random steel rod, which I bent and ground into something that looks vaguely like an internal thread cutting tool mixed with a cutoff tool. I don't really know what the proper name for something like this is. After figuring out where I wanted the groove to be, I took a cut and then did a gentle cleanup pass. Turns out, short mild steel cuts Teflon wonderfully, and this works great as a boring bar as well as a groove cutting tool. 
Before I'd cut the second half of this groove, if I'd put the two pieces together, as I turned them, they would slowly force themselves apart. But with this groove, now when I put them together, they lock into place, and it actually takes pretty significant effort to get them back apart. But everything still rotates beautifully. With the coupling cord done, we can now focus on motorizing this. This was a fairly simple task. We didn't have the right gears around the lab, but I found some gear belts that mesh together, so I decided to make a gear out of the larger gear belt and some wood. I turned a cylinder out of a piece of spruce 2x8 I found lying around, using a mandrel made of a random steel rod and some tail support. Originally, I'd bought this glass extender tube that I was going to mount the gear on, but decided to scrap that idea once I realized how large the coupling itself would be. But in the process of this, I had initially taken the cylinder off the lathe and drilled out the center with a big hole saw, which of course was too small to fit onto the coupling and too small to fit back onto the lathe. I ended up making a wooden mandrel to fit this back onto the lathe so that I could cut a disc the width of the gear belt to make the final gear. I also took a skim cut to make sure that everything was concentric, as even though I'd taken the time with an indicator to make sure the part was running true, I knew it was a bit off. Then I widened the inner diameter to fit the coupling, and then used the cutoff tool to part off the disc of material that I needed. After some brief sanding, I gave the disc a quick paint job to make it look better, but that meant I couldn't handle it for a while. So while that dried, I started working on the frame to mount this all in. I did a lot of this off camera since it's just building a wooden square, but the cliff notes are that it's a rectangle where the longest faces each have a hole cut in the middle to fit the coupling. One of which is smaller for a very tight fit on the upper half of the coupling, and one of which is bigger for a loose free moving fit on the lower half of the coupling. I actually ended up miscalculating a little bit, and once this was all built and assembled, the flask would actually bump into the wood ever so slightly, preventing it from sealing properly. So I ended up having to chamfer the outer edge of the hole, which fixed the issue and left more breathing room for any glassware that gets attached here. Once the paint was dry and the box pieces were ready, I epoxied the wheel to the lower half of the coupling, and then the belt to the wheel. I've already chosen a motor that had a gear wheel on it that worked with these belts, so all that I did was mount it to the box with the copper strap, such that once it was tightened down, it held the belt firmly without slipping. All this needs is a bit of power, and it instantly starts turning beautifully. Okay, here it is with some more glassware attached. I've got a thermometer elbow at the top and one of my Nile Red flasks at the bottom. Just by varying the voltage, I can control the speed pretty smoothly. And unless I really go crazy on the speed, the top half is essentially undisturbed, which is exactly what we want. Off camera, I'll attach some hardware to the side to allow this to be mounted onto a retort stand, and also build a couple of stands to hold the whole system. And that's pretty much all there is to it. Like I said at the beginning, I'll go through the rest of the system when we get to it, but this is by far the most challenging part of the whole thing. I'm super pleased with how this turned out, and I think it actually looks really professional. Definitely a big step up from Cogsworth. For those interested in making one of these yourself, here's a drawing with all the specs and dimensions. All told, this cost very little to make. The rod of Teflon I started with cost about 30 bucks, and the distillation equipment that makes up the rest of the system costs all of 40 and the vacuum pump I'm using comes out of a broken fridge. Everything else was just random parts I had lying around. Considering Rotovaps can easily run a price tag of 6k, I'd call that a win if this works as well as I suspect it should. If you enjoyed this video, then be sure to check out my last machining video, as we work with some different materials and also cover some really interesting ultrasonic stuff. And that's where I'll end this episode. As always, a huge thank you to my amazing patrons and channel members who make these videos possible. And if you'd like to see these projects long before they end up in videos, be sure to head over to my other social media pages, especially Instagram. That's all for now, and I'll see you next week.